Okay. So without further ado, um, our speaker is also our co-host. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, say that we have been listening on every level. We know that um, working with teams and partnerships um, and having all of the, per, uh, the personalities come together in their expertise, there's so many reasons why it is difficult to find common ground and sometimes re, um, reduce conflict. We know that, that, uh, that our current times and our environments add to that. People are stressed. I don't know about you, but I'm really looking forward to having a holiday break. But whenever we have these heightened uh, environments and emotions and we welcome everybody to the table, we know there's going to be conflict. And so Gail, once again, rose to saying, I've got a presentation like this that I'm doing for on a national level. Hey, Deb, how about we bring it to this group? We're going to be today talking about how it supports and, and really dealing with topics from, from you. And, and in the uh, therapy world, but we're also going to be doing a part B and focusing on the uh, outcome world and uh, addressing conflict with team members there as well. Look for an announcement on that. So timely, Gail, you really don't need any introduction. You are well known here. But what I want to say is that we sometimes I think we take for granted that you are always going to be part of what we're doing and you are an, a statewide treasure, but you are also uh, working with teams on these very topics um, across the country. I, and I just want to reiterate that Gail is our, uh, Oregon's, we put boundaries, we say Gail is ours, but she's really national and, and she's getting great response to these con conversations everywhere. So Gail, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and ask you to please start leading us through this discussion. Thank you, Deb. I, you can claim me in Oregon. I've been an Oregonian for way more than half my life, although I'm not a native. So I realize that uh, doesn't really qualify me as an Oregonian to those of you who are natives. Um, I'm very excited to be invited to do this topic today. Um, I wanted to say that up front that this is a, a a very short kind of synopsis of a full day free conference workshop that um, I developed originally quite some years ago with my friend Penny Reed and then have used in bits and pieces in a number of different settings in my consultation and, and presentation work. But it just really seemed like um, now was a time to at least bring this conversation back to the table and, and have some discussions about some of the basic principles of finding common ground and, and dealing with conflict. I, at the beginning of the school year especially, I heard so many people say it's really hard in the schools right now. And it was hard for a number of reasons, but one of them was that we were coming back to face-to-face -to -face school in, in whole new ways. We were trying to solve a million problems all at the same time. And we were uh, running into uh, very different ideas about what was important, very different ideas about the solutions to important things. So this is a, a list that I don't need to read to you because you've all lived it. Um, but these are some of the challenges and changes that have happened for us in the last uh, six months as we return to something that looked a little bit more like normal school, but not as normal as we had hoped it would be. And the, the bullet point on here that really stands out for me is that we have had an enormous need to pivot and remain adaptable. Um, we've had to make lots and lots of changes. One of the things we know is that whenever pe people are asked to make changes without their buy-in, we create resistance. And I 
venture to say there's not a person on this call who wasn't asked to make some changes without buying into them during this pandemic. Sometimes we thought things were too strict. Sometimes we thought things weren't strict enough. There's been all kinds of changes that we had to make, but without us being able to buy into some of those changes, we saw a lot of resistance developing. And I promise you, I am not gonna talk today about politics because that was even a, you know, even a bigger, is still even a bigger discussion. But I think a lot of the um, strategies that we're gonna talk about today are, um, ones that can apply in any situation. And I also want to say that they can apply in any situation. Um, and these are ideas that I use in, in my work, in my personal life. Um, it is not totally specific to therapy, but what we've heard from people is this um, presentation can just offer you some tools to think about when you enter into conflict situations. So as I began to research this topic, one of the things that really struck me that I did not have in my toolkit or in my brain is that change is often a source of, of disagreement or conflict. That much I knew. But Michael Fullen says, assume that conflict and disagreement are not only inevitable, but fundamental to successful change. Fullen is the head of the Toronto Institute for, for Educational Change, and he's worked with school districts and uh, other agencies all over the world to, um, to help them make changes in their process. And as he's done that, he studied what it takes to have successful change. So one of the things Fullen says is that conflict and disagreement are essential to having successful change. And if you think about it, that can make sense because if we all agree on everything, then we won't make any changes. If we all think, oh, this is perfect, this is what's going on, we won't make any changes. So that really struck me as a concept that was important to have. But let's tease out the details of that a little bit. What is the difference between conflict and disagreement? Um, I think sometimes people think that these two words are synonymous. And I, if that's the way you use them, then the, the, you're right. But I, for the purposes of our discussion today, I want to define conflict and define disagreement so that we can um, move forward in, in thinking about what's, how do we make successful change when we have conflict and disagreement? Because I think your strategies are two different strategies. So uh, here's a University of West Virginia definition, conflict is a strong disagreement or collision of values, needs, interests, or intentions that is seen as dysfunctional, unhealthy comp competition, loss of affinity, hostility, suspicion, and trust. Now, if you haven't had a conflict situation in your life recently, congratulations, but you can certainly watch it on television these days. So conflict implies that not only is there a disagreement or a, he says collision of values, but that people aren't trusting each other, aren't working together, things like that. He goes on to say that when conflict occurs, basic needs are not met. An individual or a group is seen to be obstructing. So I, 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 I'm hoping that as we talk about this a little bit today, you begin to think of some conflict situations or some disagreement situations that you've encountered in the last whatever time, but the last six months, and they may be work situations. That's what we're here for today is for work, but they may also be personal situations or, or uh, 
times when you met somebody in the grocery store and you had a disagreement about something. Um, so conflict is seen basically as a negative, unhealthy uh, interaction between at least two people. Disagreement, on the other hand, is a difference of opinion that's based on the information we have, our personal orientation, our values, our needs, our interests. And disagreement with this definition is seen as functional or positive. I know all of you sit on some kind of educational team where you are trying to solve a problem, whether it be an IEP meeting, an IFSP meeting, or even a, a therapy meet, you know, it's a therapist cohort meeting, the OTs or the PTs in your program. And you've had some disagreements about how to solve a particular problem or where to go next. Um, how strongly you feel about disagreements and, and your reaction to disagreements can actually have the effect of turning what could be just a disagreement, a difference of opinion into conflict. If we're not careful, we all have opinions and ways of doing things. And as long as we don't get overstressed with disagreement, it really is an opportunity to think of new solutions. So if we talk, go back to conflict, products of conflict are barriers, they're an end to communication, um, anger, escalation, polarization. I wanted to say to you that when I was the uh, coordinator of, of RSOI and OTAP many years ago, one of the things that used to happen to me a lot was that, um, a district that had had difficulty um, in coming to agreement with, with a family about the needs of, of a particular child would call me and ask me to come and, and help um, find some resolution to that disagreement. And one of the things I saw over and over again when there was that kind of disagreement, usually in my case with families, was that not only was there barriers to communication because of the disagreement, but in many cases, the people who were in the middle of the disagreement had stopped talking to each other entirely. So I learned when I was asked to come in as a, as a consultant and kind of a mediator to say, okay, who's the primary contact for this family? Who's the primary contact for this uh, private therapist and to, to identify at least the beginnings of some kind of um, communication pathway. So conflict really to me is a lot about stopping the communication and then as a result, you get anger, you get escalation, you get polarization. If you're talking about disagreement, there's, there's not that negative connotation. So if you disagree on the right path for something or the right services that a child needs or things like that, and you can have conversations that are based on the needs, what you get is new ideas. You get better ways of doing things and you get change. Um, so I, I wanted to do that introduction to conflict and disagreement because it's pretty basic to the, the kind of uh, conversation that I hope we have the rest of the way. Now, this slide uh, is, is kind of made me laugh. Um, the absence of disagreement is not harmony, it's apathy. And you can see here that the road crew was too lazy to get off the truck and move that this branch in the middle of the road. So they just drew a line around it. They made a little detour around that branch. That's apathy. That's, I don't care how straight the line is. I don't care, um, you know, how good my work is. And 
so it just seemed like a really good definition of apathy. Unfortunately, I think in order to avoid conflict, we sometimes don't disagree. And what we get is not harmony, but apathy. So I have a little quiz for you. What I want you to do in, in, uh, is to read these five statements. I have to move some things on my screen here so I can read them. Read these five statements about your approach to conflict and identify a, the number of the one um, that most applies to you. Now, some people are going to say, uh, well, it's different for me at work than it is at home. And that's fine. We all have different styles and approaches to conflict based on our environment. So we're, um, we're working this morning. So probably I want to suggest that you think about work. But if you have an, an, a, an approach to a conflict or you're thinking of a conflict or a disagreement, in some other environment, that's just fine. And I'm gonna be quiet for just a minute, and take a sip of coffee while you do that. Yeah, I'm just wondering in an approach to uh, universal design, should we read these out loud for those who are not able to at this moment? Well, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so number one is I usually find it productive to smooth over the other person's feelings when I'm involved in a disagreement. I don't get upset or make waves. Number two, does this describe you? For me, a disagreement situation is a real challenge since there's usually one who is right and one who is wrong. I don't want to be wrong, so I'll make my point. Number three. In a disagreement situation, I usually sit down and try to work out the disagreement. Number four, when disagreements occur, both sides have to be prepared to give a little. And number five, I don't like hostility and tension that result from disagreements. I try to avoid disagreements entirely and not deal with confrontation and disputes. So I absolutely know that none of these are gonna apply perfectly to you because we are all very different people and I love that. Um, but keep that number in mind because we're gonna talk about it a little more. These statements are summaries from something that's called the Blake and Mouton Managerial Grid. Um, this is a, a business company that really, um, it does a lot of work in uh, big companies, big businesses, particularly with managerial teams. And I've given you the link on this slide and hopefully somebody will put it in the chat for me. Um, but the, it, this has a little bit longer and more um, well-defined uh, a self-assessment and then gives you a way to score yourself. Um, we com combined it down to uh, five different questions that represent the different styles of this scale. So I want to show you what the actual scale looks like here. Um, what these authors talk about is that there are really five different conflict resolution approaches. And they, they are based on the, the um, on two axes. So you see a graph here. Um, and the horizontal axis is the value of the goal, of the value of your own goal for this interaction. So if it's, the question is, is it of low importance or high importance to you? The vertical axis is the value of the relationship. So is it important to you to maintain peace and keep this relationship um, as friendly as possible? Or is it not so important to you with this particular situation or this particular person to, um, to maintain a good relationship? What 
what Blake and Moulton say is that each part, a quadrant of this graph represents a different style of doing things. So if you are competitive, they, they've named these styles, but if they are, if you are a competitive person, then what you will see, you're over here in this lower right-hand corner of the grid, if you're, if you're really at an extreme, um, in which case the focus is, I wanna win this and you will lose because I want my way so strongly. The second style is accommodating. Um, you're going to be up here on, I want this relationship to be so, uh, this relationship is so important to me that I will do anything, including giving up my own values and goals in order to keep the relationship. Number three on, on this list is avoiding. <clears throat> and that, that's down in the lower um, left-hand corner. And avoiding is, I just don't want this situation. I want it to go away. So I'm not going to deal with it at all. And that's, I, I mentioned before that often when I was called in to deal with conflict situations, what had happened was it was, it got so scary to people that they just stopped participating in the conversation at all. Number four is compromising. I win some, you win some, and that's uh, in the center of the graph. And then finally up in the upper right-hand corner, you value the goal, but you also value the relationship. So you find ways to collaborate. Now, what Blake and Moulton say about this is, the, oh, well, first of all, the scale itself gives you a number. So you, um, I end up up in this upper right-hand corner, somewhere between compromising and collaborating, the number I get, um, which is how I see myself. But it was very helpful to me to think about it in this way and think about what how I might use that when I do run into a conflict situation. Um, oh, there it was, I'm sorry, that, there's my score. So you can use that scale that we gave you the link to and um, get a score for yourself. What I wanna say is there are no wrong or right answers. The important thing here is to know what your style is when conflict starts to occur. Because if you aren't aware of your own style and may be aware of the style of the other people that you're working with, then it's much more difficult to deal with conflict and disagreement. I have a video here, hoping this is gonna play well. It's a very short video from the people who run a company called Crucial Learning. It's another uh, consulting firm that deals with conflicts on teams. Let's see if my link works. Yeah. Now, Deb, you need to tell me if the sound comes out all right. Are you hearing it? We all know adults stink at talking about tough things, but how about little kids? Here's my experiment. Feed kids wretched brownies, then see if they'll tell you the truth. It's good, Especially yeah. when they think it might hurt your feelings. First, I made the brownies. Lots of chocolate, eggs, flour, but instead of just sugar, I added in salt. Lots of salt. So I just need to check, is the sound okay? Yes, it is. I did, okay, maybe you couldn't hear me, but yes, it's just fine. Thank you. There's no way they can like these better. Then I invited kids of various ages for a taste test. I told them I want to compare ordinary brownies to my special brownies. My dear grandmother's special recipe. My dear dead grandmother's special recipe. 
I gave them some cash for being such a big help. Okay, here it goes. First, the yummy sugar brownies. Next, they ate the salt bricks. Watch this girl. She can barely choke it down. And how about this girl? Even this kid. Look at that face. And now for the crucial moment. Will they tell me the truth and possibly offend me? I asked them to point to the brownies they like best. No surprise that some try to spare my feelings. But watch, even the one who gagged. And how about really little kids? Yep. Wow. But do you want to know what they really thought? Here guys, I have leftovers. Does anybody want seconds? So I've kind of come to call this the uh, salt brick approach to conflict. Um, I love the story. One of the things I want to say about this story is that um, different people have researched this phenomenon um, in many different ways. And um, you almost always get the uh, the same kinds of results, no matter how you set it up, you know, where there's a clear answer, but you're in danger of um, messing up a relationship. Um, you get the consistent um, focus of many, many people to focus on the relationship. So that's what happened here. These kids all said, I don't wanna hurt her feelings. So I'm going to not tell the truth um, about how I feel about the, the salt bricks. What I wanted to do now is go back to the part that we um, started with in this style scale. And I've attacked, we've talked about the, diff, the five different styles. I've attached the statements that you, um, looked at earlier without the without the names of the styles in them and um i think that you should be able to find your style or the thing you do most often i realize none of us have any kind of a pure style but the thing that you do most often in your conflict situations um to to the names that the Molten people use in their scale. So are you accommodating? Do you find it productive to smooth over the other person's feelings? Are you competitive? You want to be right to, and insist on making your point. Are you good at collaborating? Do you try and sit down and work out the disagreement? So actually come to a common set of values are you compromising some, I'm gonna win some and I'm gonna lose some? Or are you a person who avoids, which is what we saw in this video, um, I don't like hostility intention, so I'm gonna to try to avoid it. Um, what I wanna say about that is that none of these styles are right or wrong. And we all have a little bit of all of them in us, but knowing your style, knowing this model will help us find the best approach to our own um, personality and conflict situations, and then adapt the situation so that, that we can um, make progress and find common ground. I want to but also, and also, 
that style interacts with the teams that we work with. And we, we're going to move now from thinking about our own styles and our own personal styles, which I think is really important as we begin to um, move forward thinking about disagreement and conflict. And then how might it help us to know not only our own styles, but the styles of the other people on a team when there's, when there's a conflict that arises? It, I don't mean to imply that we need to do a big team analysis or anything like that. I think just understanding your own style and observing the styles of other people can be very valuable in figuring out how to approach team conflict and team disagreement. Um, and as I said, this is a place where in the full day workshop, we would stop and do a lot of work in this area about thinking about how our teams um, are functioning and, and how the different styles of the people on the team um, apply to or affect, excuse me, affect the situation. When we think about teams though, these are some of the main causes of conflict that we run across. So we may have conflict because of communication difficulties, whether it's stopping communication or communicating too much, not letting anybody else talk or unclear communication that doesn't like, like the, salt brick brownies, um, where people aren't really saying the whole truth. Um, another cause of conflict is that trust is not established. And then thirdly, if you have opposing agendas, if you are trying to accomplish one thing when the rest of the team is trying to really accomplish something else, opposing agendas, can really come into play. So again, I want to encourage you to think about a situation where you sat on some kind of a team or work group and you had conflict and disagree or disagreement on that team or work group. And right now I want to challenge you to think about how, which of these bullet points really were evident as you uh, ran across that conflict or disagreement. But let's talk about each one of them a little bit more. So communication difficulties is the first one. There is lack of communication. We've talked about that several times. Lack of respectful communication. Um, I, <laughs> Every time I see that bullet, I think of, of, of a person that I worked with in my early career in Oregon, who we were having a, a pretty significant disagreement and um, actually we we're having pretty significant conflict. And we had a meeting with our supervisor at which point uh, in the middle of the conversation, she said to me, Gail, if I disagreed with you, there was there is no way I was going to tell you that. And so I, I still remember that because it was such a puzzling thing to say to me. But it really helped me understand the situation and the reason that we were having a conflict and not disagreement because we couldn't disagree because she couldn't tell me the truth. Um, so another reason another for communication difficulties is a lack of opportunity to contribute or to communicate. If somebody talks all the time, then the other people don't get a chance to talk. Um, or if one person runs an agenda and identifies specifically what each person will communicate without any chance for open communication, that's a communication difficulty that may not allow issues to surface. Um, right before the session today, Deb was talking about how much we have come to value in Oregon 
the town hall meetings that we're having and the breakout groups in in echo sessions or in uh, other other kinds of meetings because everybody gets a chance to communicate. So I think even virtually we're learning ways to encourage opportunities to communicate. And if you don't get all the information out, then you have a communication difficulty. When there's somebody in the room who's primarily sitting and listening, um, that can be a communication difficulty because you never get that person's point of view. Or when team members are in such conflict that they refuse to talk to each other, that can be a, another sign of communication difficulty. So I'm suspecting that many of you have been in some kind of meeting or teamwork situation where at least two or three of these um, situations occurs. The next main reason for conflict on teams is um, that there's a lack of trust. Partly there's a lack of trust because nobody expects you to be accountable for what you say. So I know I've been in some meetings where somebody just made some kind of outrageous statement. Like if we do this for this child, oh, I know. If we give this child a wheelchair now, she will never learn to walk. Um, that, that was a meeting I sat in um, recently. And what I, what I wanted to say was, how do you know that? You know, what are the, what are the other things that we could do to, um, to make sure that happens? But is there research that says if kids get wheelchairs, they'll never learn to walk? Um, things like that. So trust not established because somebody says something really as a fact that may or may not be a fact. Um, another reason that trust is not established is if somebody clearly is trying to protect their position um, rather than trying to come to some kind of resolution or, or solution that the team wants to do. If we have a habit of blaming others, you know, if the first question that comes up for the team is whose fault is this, then we're not going to be able to trust each other to talk about real issues. And the other two that really make for difficulty in teamwork is um, conversations that happen outside of the meeting. So either gossip about team members, that happens outside the meeting and usually just between one or two people or side conversations after the meeting where you say what you really thought and not what was said in the, in the middle of the meeting. So communicate, communication difficulties, trust not established, and then finally opposing agendas. And this is a tricky one because you can have opposing agendas and have good, productive disagreement as long as your agendas are stated. But when opposing agendas are hidden, when what I really want, uh, let me tell you a story about an assistive technology situation. I once worked with a, a team um, and the child in question was a fourth grader who um, had only one hand and had had to have his legs amputated because of an illness. So he was pretty significantly physically impaired, but he had no cognitive difficulties and he was in a regular fourth grade classroom. Um, I, as a part of an evaluation that I was asked to do, I sent a form to everybody on the team and asked, you know, what, what solutions had they considered for the problems that we had identified? What kinds of things did they think, had they tried that didn't work or had they tried that did work? Things like that. And on every form except for one, People had ideas, they listed things they'd tried and things that, that had worked and hadn't worked. 
But on one of the forms that came back to me before we ever actually met as a team, the person had said, I think this child needs a one-to-one -one aid in this classroom because it was a general ed classroom. And I don't think any other solution will work. So she had actually a hidden agenda what, that she wasn't stating to the team because she knew it would be an unpopular uh, solution to, to try and hire um, you know, one more staff person for the school that's never the, you know, the, the go-to, the, the beginning, the place you start with finding a solution. But so I was able, because all those forms were anonymous, I was able to make a list of all the solutions that people had suggested. And when we got to the meeting, rather than saying hire a one-to-one -one aid for this child on the list that I presented as, as possible solutions, I said additional staff time may be needed. So we changed the conversation a little bit, but we also got that hidden agenda out <laughs> in front of the whole group. Um, so those are usually the three reasons for conflict on a team, poor communication, trust not established, and opposing agendas. But how can we help teams find common ground? Um, here's a quote from another, <laughs> today's my day to do business kinds of things. One of the things that research tells us is that the health of a relationship, a team, or an organization is a function of the average lag time between identifying and discussing problems. I want to say it again, a function of the lag time between identifying and discussing problems. It makes sense if you think about it. The longer you let something go because you want to avoid conflict or you, or you don't want to disagree with somebody or you don't want to raise a problem that is, involves interpersonal um, you know, communication and trust, the longer you wait, the more difficult the relationship or the problem is going to be. And I think that's really uh, an important thing to know. And it makes sense because if you think about it, you know, it, if problems aren't addressed and people are recognizing them, what you get is um, people kind of stewing in their own juices and the problems tend to grow and be better. Now we have to approach those problems in productive ways. And um, in our second session on finding common ground, um, we're going to talk more specifically about those productive ways to address um, conflict. But what we're going to, what I want to do right now is talk about this issue, whatever the problem, effective teams identify, raise, and resolve it. If it's keeping them from reaching their goal, effective teams try to do something about it. They don't ignore it and hope it goes away. By not addressing conflict, the leaders risk sending the message that conflict is unmanageable. So if we don't talk about it, the implication and the fear becomes, well, this isn't a manageable situation. Um, and it may cause members to become complacent or feel their input isn't valued. So that was an important thing to me. Teams that do address disagreement and conflict well, have a process. So let's talk about what it takes to develop a shared pool of meaning and a, a, that agenda that isn't opposing, that we're all headed in the same direction on the same path. I gave you one example of how that might happen, which is getting everybody to anonymously give their ideas and their thoughts on the issue and then compiling those uh, in, in an anonymous way. But let's talk about general team process for just a minute. I've actually found this really interesting and you may be saying, oh, Gail, you're one of those people that finds things really interesting. 
Um, but let's talk about some research from Canner about how teams work. I think many of us assume that when we have a new topic here on the left, the way teams make decisions <laughs> is that a whole bunch of people have ideas, they throw those ideas out, and then eventually they get to a decision point. What we know from research is that that's not really how it goes. Um, here's the beginning of a, a process about a new topic in decision making. What tends to happen is that as we as a team discuss things, the, the uh, arrows get less and less direct to a solution and spread out more and more. And actually, if you've been in any kind of a good brainstorming session, that's what um, that's what you will see happen. At first, if we ask for brainstorming, we get lots and lots of ideas from people. They get more and more um, spread apart. And here's what it begins to look like. So as we start a new topic, we'll have many, many divergent ideas. People will be going different directions because we really haven't determined what our common goal or our common ground is going to be. Those ideas spread out more and more. Um, and then over time, they tend to come together. But it is this part in the middle, this part where things are very divergent, that the most creative ideas often happen. I want to emphasize that a little bit more by saying when we have a new topic, if all those little circles that are bunched up in the beginning of that triangle are the ideas that are proposed first, what tends to happen is those are not the most creative or the new ideas. It's after there's no obvious solution using the familiar options that we begin this spreading out of the, um, of the ideas that we have. And you can see here that as the thinking diverges, we also get more and more creative as long as we are able to maintain that shared pool of meaning, all maintain some sort of vision of what our common goal is. Those, those um, perspectives get more and more diverse over time. And um, one of the things that happens is that we start with familiar options and then our perspectives get bigger and bigger. So we get more creative. What has to happen um, is that you know, this slide's just in the wrong place. So I'm gonna skip it. It should have been before the previous slide. I don't know how I did that. Um, but what has to happen is that we have to maintain that shared pool of meaning. We have to maintain the plan for where we are going and what is our common goal. Um, whatever the decision-making method, the greater the shared pool of meaning, the better the choices, the more unity and the stronger conviction of the team is no matter who makes the final decision. So the time you spend up front creating a shared pool of meaning, really meaning, really uh, setting a goal, having a vision for where you wanna go may take more time than you want it to. I know I am an impatient person and I want to just always say, well, can't we just get to work? Um, for those of you who are participating at all in the AIM cohort work that we're doing, that's been, I think, a process for many of us um, as we began to tease out our goals and the ways that we wanted to do things. It just felt like it took forever to come to a vision of where we were going, but now we have a vision. And this is the part, this part in the middle that's labeled struggle in the service of integration is what helps us 
to find common ground as we start with a new topic, move to many, many ideas, and then um, bring our thinking back together until we can reach a decision point. So uh, what I will, the reason I present this idea is because it's really important to know that teams do this and that we have a lot of divergent thinking and a lot of um, struggle in the middle of any process of getting going um, and finding common ground. If we get to this decision point, some different things may happen. We may agree to a solution and develop an action plan, but what we may have to do is identify tiny next steps and plan for those next steps in order to further clarify what needs to be done. And then maybe we have to set a timeline. Throughout this process of trying to find common ground, um, we have to plan how we're going to reach agreement or, or plan to to figure that out in the future. But it's really important not to forget to celebrate. Um, for those of you who were on the, uh, or a part of the uh, mask protocols working group that we did last year, this is a perfect description. This is a perfect description of the work that that working group did. There were some initial ideas that we thought were the answers, but as we struggled and began to look at other options, we really had in the in the middle period of that a struggle to figure out what it was we could and couldn't do and what was going to be useful to the field. And then as things moved forward, um, they converged into a much more solidified process. And we get some wonderful products out of that. So that's the end of my presentation part for today. I want to say that it's important to think about um, how we're disagreeing and how we approach disagreement. And in a future um, echo session, we're going to talk about some very specific approaches to finding common ground. But for now, think about that process, think about your own style under stress, and don't confuse unanimous agreement with uh, major that it, majority rule, minority rule, or authority rule. Finding disagreement, uh, addressing disagreement face-to-face -face is, is a very important skill and one that we really uh, <coughs> need to learn to value instead of hiding from. So I'm gonna stop sharing for just a minute. That was my lecture part. I wanted to ask if there were any questions or comments or anything that happened in the chat box um, while I was doing that presentation. And then uh, what we're gonna do next is um, something that we're calling a case study, but it's a case study about some teams and some disagreements. So that'll be a real opportunity to uh, interact. But anybody have any comments or questions at this point? Or Deb, did you see anything in the chat box? Well, I've been posting some resources, a few things here, but um, I, but mostly I think that probably everyone can relate to just about every scenario that you talked about and, and the, and that type of personality that you come into with. And, and I may come in about, you, you know, people are their personality types, they're their leadership styles, they're their conflict styles, all of that. And sometimes it's just knowing the person that you are coming toe to toe with and knowing that if I say this, it's always going to end up the same way. And so just coming to the re respect of positions and maybe I know Gail that this is how you process and it's not always going to have to be a bone of contention. It's okay, Gail, I'm going to let you process and we know we're going to get there if our emotions don't run away. So I know we've only got 10 minutes, but again, I know that everyone can relate to the story of the team who avoided the table 
because uh, let's say an administrator might think that, okay, they really don't know what they're talking about. We don't need to give that any credence. And I'm not picking on administrators, but I know as therapists, that's probably one of the times that hit us the most is that, why can't we even come to the table and talk? And a lot of times just getting to the table is a big part of that uh, struggle. Okay. Um, I do want to encourage you, if you have any stories, um, you're welcome to share them. I created this PowerPoint with just some uh, case stories um, about different kinds of conflict, but I want to, uh, I had to put this slide in again because I think it's so important. The health or relationship of a team or organization is a function of the lag time between identifying and discussing problems. Um, another resource that you might want to look at is a book called Crucial Conversations. In that book, they talk about a crucial conversation, a conversation where you know you have to have a, have a conversation because it's just going to lead to conflict, is if it has opposing opinions, if the topic has opposing opinions, strong emotions, and high stakes. And we'll talk more about that in in a future uh, webinar, but again, it's that theme of we often back away. So here's a story that really happened. Um, I was uh, working as a, as a consultant, that, please know I am not an OT, but um, here's a story that, that actually happened. One of the students on your caseload has, also has a private OT who works with her. Yesterday, the student's mother came in to talk with you and she said, my daughter's clinical OT says that she thinks you're not doing a good job. She thinks that you ought to be doing 20 minutes of direct therapy with her at least three times a week. Okay, anybody ever had a situation like that? Yeah, <laughs> I, see, I see real hands going up. So my first question for you, we've talked about this conflict uh, style under pressure kind of um, idea. My first question for you to think about and type in the chat if you want to or unmute yourself if you want to, um, what style comes most naturally to you when this happens? When, when something like this happens to you, are you accommodating? Are you competing? Are you saying, I, I don't wanna be wrong, I'm doing it right. Are you collaborating? Do you sit down and try and work out the disagreement or do you compromise? Maybe we could only do 20 minutes of therapy once a week or are you avoiding the conversation at all? So think about that. Um, and then let's talk about what should this about OT do. Carol, I'm going to pick on you and you can tell me no, but I saw you raise your hand. Um, so what, what kinds of strategies or suggestions for this situation do you have? Um, and I'm a PT. Uh, yeah. People who don't know me. Um, to me, it's all about the trust that you have built with that parent. And if the parent has trust in you, then you can have a conversation collaboratively. If the parent doesn't and trust the private therapist, you're going to have to start with building that trust, whatever it takes to be able to do that. Uh, you know, I think that's such good advice. I mean, we, it, and it's such a nice direct application to what um, what we've just learned about and thought about in this presentation that you can't you have conversation. I mean, you have oh, I totally lost that thought. Something flashed on my screen and I, um, but building trust has to happen before you um, can have the conversation. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, I see a hand up, Manaz. What did you? What would you like to say? Um, 
I agree. Trust has to be built. And then um, I find because I don't, you know, at the initial IEP, you're kind of explaining to the team and the parent what your role will be at, at, in this consult model that we do. Mm -hmm. Then when that type of situation arises, I think it's all about helping both parties, parent and clinic, understand the role, maybe having some documents to support that, and then um, also compromising on, you know, where, she, where's the, where's, where are they coming from to try to see if we can find a bridge, whether it be um, more collaboration with the teacher, um, bringing certain tools in to provide to the teacher, you know, kind of root causing why, it, what's, what is the issue that she wants more direct service when we already know in the school system, that isn't the model that we're working towards. So hopefully at the end, there's some better communication and trust built with the clinician for future reference in mm -hmm. the future. You know, I think what you just said last year, what's the underlying issue? Because we should be able to say, if I would want to be able to say if I were smart enough, um, what's, a, what's the underlying goal of more time? And, and take it back to the, um, the competing agendas kind of issue. It's not that more time is going to cure the child or, or you know, help with the child's therapy. It is that something isn't happening that we hope will happen for that child. And um, so more time is actually starting with the solution rather than looking at what the, uh, what the issue is. Anybody else got comments about this? Okay, let's let's take another story. I, I want to comment too that when you say about background, it's sometimes it's hard to know where the team and where the family has been. And oftentimes the, the parent might have felt like they weren't being heard in the past. And so they bring that to the table as well. Just a lot of uh, a lot of things that everybody brings to that point where we're talking. And if a parent doesn't feel like they've been heard, I mean, they are they're tired of asking. They don't know how to ask it any clearer. And so sometimes we look at the parent as somebody who isn't really aware of what they need when what they really need is validation that whatever they're doing is being heard. Right. And to me, that has to happen. We have to tease that out. We have to understand the background of the request before we can go to address the problem. I think many of us are so stressed and so pushed forward that we wanna just find a solution and move on to the next thing. And sometimes that's appropriate. If, if there is a quick solution and it'll work for everybody, that's fine. This story um, probably doesn't have a quick solution because you've got people who are, aren't even in the room contributing to the conversation. So there's not good communication. That was one of the you know, one of the characteristics of uh, developing conflict. Um, there isn't trust established between the, all the parties because as you said, Deb, the parents may have had a, a bad experience or felt not heard or whatever. And you have opposing agendas. There's, does she need 20 minutes? three times a week or does she need to have better integrated therapy or what's the goal of the thing of the uh, request so my message and it's time for me to to stop but my message is it's fine to slow down it's fine to create trust improve communication make sure all the parties that need to be communicating are involved in the conversation and clarify what the agenda is. Is it time or is it some kind of goal for the child in this case? Um, before we move forward. So you remember that slide with all the uh, ideas in the middle and the, the uh, what did we call it? Struggle and service of integration. 
So this is a situation where we may have to struggle just a little bit in service of integration. As you do that, I think it's really important to remember what your own style is, whether you are accommodating, competing, uh, uh, collaborating, compromising or avoiding, what is your tendency as you begin to address the conversation directly? So my clock says 9.15, that's when we're supposed to stop. I wanna thank you all for being here today. And uh, as 